the term anabolic resistance is is intuitive because obviously people understand what insulin resistance is, but with insulin resistance, we we can actually really explain mechanistically what's happening. I referred to Jerry Shulman. He provided a very, very uh, elegant explanation of what's happening intracellularly, right? What the tri, what the triglyceride or diacylglyceride, if I'm not mistaken, is doing in the cell and how it's impeding the signal transduction to move the GLUT4 transporter up to the translocated site to bring more glucose in, et cetera. I haven't followed that discussion, but I mean, it's still, as, as, as I know, as I believe, it's still a discussion which fatty acid intermediate is actually causing the whole signaling. Is it the storage of the fat? Is the inflammation that you get from the storage of fat? Is it diacylglycerol? Is it, are the ceramides, the fatty acyl-CoA? I mean, yes, but it's at least the inability to process that fat in the muscle is inducing the insulin resistance. So the question now is, do we have the same level of detail around what is actually inducing anabolic resistance, which is a topic that I don't think people are as familiar with, but unfortunately need to be as familiar with, given its prevalence under two conditions, inactivity and aging? I think that's, that's, that's the, the million dollar question. So um, I think the first time that uh, anabolic resistance was was published, as the name was coined, was by uh, by the people in Dundee, Mike Rennie, the late Mike Rennie. So he did a study where he provided essential amino acids to people, young and elderly. And when they provided a greater amount of essential amino acids, you saw in the young people a greater muscle protein synthetic response, as we discussed before. He got, he got the greatest response, the highest muscle protein synthesis following the provision of 10 grams of essential amino acids, which is perfect because 10 grams of essential amino acid translates to about 20 grams of protein. So it nicely fits with those other studies. If he gave 20 grams of essential amino acids, there was no significant further increase over the next few hours. So that was normal response and in line with everything that we discussed before. If he did the same thing with the older population, he saw that that increase in muscle protein synthesis was less steep and also leveled off more rapidly. So that's how he coined anabolic resistance. And that was, I think, 2005. Now, it took our lab almost 10 years to verify or to confirm those data because we wanted to show the same thing with a less uh, lab-based approach, not essential, with that 20 grams of intrinsically labeled protein. And so when we actually finally managed to do that study over a long period of time, we saw that basal protein synthesis is not different between young and elderly. So if they're relatively active, basal protein synthesis, if there's a difference, it's actually higher in elderly than in young. But the response to the 20 grams of protein was much, much uh, is less in the older population. So the same amount of protein that was ingested did not lead to the same amount of protein synthesis. And with the intrinsically of a protein, we could show that less of the ingested protein was converted to muscle. So that is also anabolic resistance in a more single meal-like type of approach. Now, the big question is, and this is now a lot of people are focusing on anabolic resistance, what is causing anabolic resistance? That could be digestion. That could be absorption. That could, could be, and that's what they call splenic sequestration, the uptake of amino acids and what happens between the, taking up in the gut and releasing in the circulation. And of course, if scientists use difficult names, always beware. It generally means that they <laughs> don't know what they're talking about. So when we go say splenic sequestration, everybody says like, okay, but it just simply means we don't know to what extent the amino acids that were actually going to the portal vein or actually being absorbed in the intestinal tissues and not being released in the circulation. That's splenic sequestration. Where is it? Is it in the liver? Is it still in the intestine? Is it taken to other tissues in between the, the portal vein, like lymphatic system? We don't know exactly. And then the release in the circulation. But then insulin also plays a role because if there's not enough insulin, and insulin is not stimulatory but permissive, is how much of the tissues are being perfunded. So they get blood because if the blood doesn't perfuse the muscle, those free amino acids are never going to be seen by the muscle. Then we have the uptake in the muscle, and then you have those signaling responses, mTOR pathway in the muscle. 
on all these levels, anabolic resistance can reside. So it's impossible to find it. And so a lot of people are focusing on all these different areas. And then the problem is, and this is the problem with every study in where we actually look at aging, we compare young and older people. We don't follow the same person for 40 or 50 years because that doesn't work for studies and it takes too long. That's why we use all those 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 animal species or every, any other, any organisms like these C. elegans or whatever. So if we compare young and old, we're not comparing the same person. We're actually comparing lifestyle, comorbidity, um, uh, uh, pharmacological interventions that they have, uh, food intake, um, all of these things. But I just said that physical activity makes the muscle more sensitive to the anabolic properties of amino acids. Does it make perfect sense to say that less physical activity makes the muscle less sensitive to uh, amino acids? So the only way to study this, and this is what we do, is we immobilize young people. So we put one leg in a cast for a week. Mm. And then if you didn't believe the story about 1% to 2% turnover of muscle, you know, because even after a week when the cast comes off, you don't need an MRI scan to see which leg had been in the cast because you actually see the muscle has less, the, the loss of muscle in that leg. How, how much do you have to pay a young person to subject themselves to a week in a cast? Oh, to be honest, that, that is actually, so one week is, I mean, six weeks will be difficult, so especially here with health sciences and medicine. A lot of the students, I mean, are active, but one, one week, they actually love the experiment. <laughs> um, and, um, I mean, now they can choose the, the color of the, of the cast as well. So <laughs> I think of so some of the actually... crazy experiments I got paid to do while I was in medical school, you know, at the time, what I would do for a thousand dollars was. I'm a, I won't admit it uh, publicly. Um, so the, ha, have you been able to study this longitudinally in a mouse, for example, where- No, no, so, so we only do uh, animal stuff, uh, human studies in vivo. I hardly do any, I mean, I do some animal work with collaborators. Is anybody studying this? Because again, you raise a good point, right? Which is without a longitudinal assessment, which would not be possible in humans, um, we really are stuck without understanding the nuances. Of course, in humans, you can do a crossover between active and inactive, and that might provide an answer to the question. But as I listen to this list of differences in absorption, circulation, uh, the Splanchnic uh, sequestration, which is, a have never considered that. Um, the, the perfusion related makes total sense. Uptake in the muscle, lower mTOR activity. We know mTOR activity is lower in the elderly. I mean, it could be any of the above. It could be all of the above. And what do I think that they're really important? I don't think so. Yeah. At the end of the day, we know what, what we know what you need to do. Control what you can control. Be more and active, see, consume more protein. But so if we take that previously immobilized leg and we give that person an amount of protein, I see a 35% difference between the leg that was previously immobilized and the leg that was not immobilized. So there's a 35% anabolic resistance after one week of inactivity. That is much more than we see as a difference between uh, the young and the older. So with one week of inactivity, I can make a young leg or young muscle respond completely like a senescent muscle. And now the fun thing, if I actually take an older person and I do some exercise and I give them protein, I see a completely normal response. If I take a biopsy of an older person, I see smaller type two fibers. If I train that person for three months, the type two fiber is bigger than the type one fiber. And I don't see any difference in the response to a young, younger person. And I can say the same thing about satellite cells. So muscle on itself is actually doesn't seem to get that old it actually still responds completely normal and I can normalize for age by physical activity. Yeah, I was about to say that ex the two examples you gave there completely changed the discussion. Again, I think it's worth restating them because when you, you're saying so many important things, I just wanna make sure people are not missing these, right? So you took a group of young, healthy people who presumably have lots of anabolic capacity, you put them in a cast for a week and you immediately demonstrate upon removing the cast that the 
the leg that has been immobile for a week is 35% less responsive to protein assimilation than the other leg. That's an anabolic resistance factor of 35%, which you also pointed out is far less, or pardon me, far greater than what you see in an aged individual. The other thing yeah, you said depends, was- depend depends whether that age is an active older or a normal or if, they, if that older person is lying in bed for three day, three weeks sure. with COVID, yep. we're yep. talking about other situations. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but then the other thing you said was you can take an aged individual who might have, you know, again, 20 or 30% less anabolic response to protein than a young person. But if you exercise them, you can bring them up to the same level as a younger person. These two factors suggest that activity might be the main determinant of anabolic resistance. And an aging individual or age within an individual is simply a proxy for activity. And so it's more difficult for older people to maybe do the same training loads but the muscle itself is still responsive. So the good news is hmm. you don't have to start exercising when you're 40 to actually have good muscle when you're 80. You can still do it at 70. Now it's better to do it at 40 as well, but at any age, and that's also 100 plus, the muscle is still very responsive to physical activity. Uh -huh.